I have been looking so forward to this weekend in this series. I'm so glad you guys are part of it. Everybody probably got a napkin when you came in. Um, that's not for communion. It's not for your coffee. It's for an illustration. So hold on to it, okay? And if you've already used it for your coffee, that's cool because that'll work. Y'all have used it up, haven't we? And we are going to take communion here in, uh, during the message, so hold on to that here for a few minutes. We're in this series, Taking It to the Streets, and we're talking about the process of evangelism. Everybody say process. process. Now, the reason I want to do this series at this point in the year is because Easter's coming in a couple weeks, and the number one time who, for people who don't go to church, your friends, neighbors, coworkers, family that are willing to come to church is Easter Sunday. So we just want to kind of talk about being equipped and getting ready to invite our friends and connect with them for Easter. Last week we talked about not only the process, but how to cultivate friendship uh, in order to develop that relationship in such a way for the sake of eternity. So that at some point we know as we care and love and develop that relationship, we're committed to helping our friends, loved ones, co-workers, neighbors, take the next step toward becoming a follower of Christ. Why is this series important? It's important because everybody spends eternity somewhere. In fact, statistics show us that 85% of the people who are followers of Jesus Christ decided to do so because of a friend or a loved one. Not because of some advertisement or some TV show. Some of you, that's why you're a follower of Christ, obviously, about 15%. But most of us, it's because of a relationship. I put it in your notes. Evangelism is a process. Salvation is an event. We've been talking about that up to this point. The good news is simple. Everybody say simple. simple. In other words, you know, for most of us, even before we're followers of Christ and those who are not, some of you, I realize you're here because a friend or, or a loved one invited you. I'm glad you're here. But we tend to think we know what we need to know and we know what we need to do. We tend to think before we become a follower of Christ, we just need to do better in life. Or or we think that that we need to just quit sinning. And and if I could have done all that, I would have on my own, right? Or if we just pray a special prayer, or just repeat repeat certain words, or make a commitment. Or I hear people all the time that they think they just need to give something to become a follower of Christ. Or promise something. There's a lot of confusion about Christianity. And the reason there's confusion is because of us. It's because of pastors a lot of times, preachers, TV evangelists. We just confuse this thing, don't we? (laughs) Not just me. Sometimes we confuse it. I'm so glad our other campuses are joining us. And right now, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to see how good we are at this, at, at, at making the gospel. That's what the Bible calls it, the good news, the gospel. We don't use those words a lot in our society but how good are we at making it simple so what we thought we would do for the virtual pastor question is a lot of you use twitter you can only have 140 characters on in twitter so 140 words or less text me your plan what how you share the gospel are you guys with me let me know which campus you're from. I know Continental Ranch is joining us as well as a lot of folks on our internet campus take your phones out text me or you can twitter me facebook whatever Now, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus told the disciples, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, 20, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Or uh, in the New Living Translation, he says, I'll show you how to fish for people. And he's talking to some fishermen here. Great analogy. Now, that's what this series is all about. As followers of Christ, we're to be fishers of men. Uh, he wants to make that of you and me. Now, notice he didn't say, I'm going to make you a great theologian. He could have. He didn't say, I'm going to make all of you, if you'll follow me, biblical scholars. Nothing wrong with any of that. that that's not what he said, though. He didn't say, I'm going to make every one of you, if you'll follow me, a pastor or a worship leader. What he said was, I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to teach you to fish for people. And that's the why behind this series. That's why it's important for us to get this. Now, I, I happen to like fishing. I like hunting, too. In fact, I, I have a picture of these guys in case you thought I really don't know how to fish. And that picture is not Photoshopped. I know some of you think it is. I have witnesses. And that's not my biggest fish, either. That's just one of them. 
Isn't that great? All you fishermen, doesn't that make you just want to lust? There's more than one way to lust. This is one of them. Now, I want, I want to talk to you for just a minute because Jesus said we're to be fishers of men. And, and a lot of times the church, followers of Christ, Christians, we tend to think of evangelism more like hunting. Now, I, I happen to like both, but they are very different. Because hunting is very aggressive. Fishing is more of a gentle sport. Let, let me give you a little bit of a comparison. For instance, hunting is based on confrontation. And some, some of you think that's the way we share the good news. We just confront people. No, that's more of a hunting thing. Fishing is based on attraction. You throw the lure out there. You're trying to catch a fish. Hunting is more of you go out and you shoot them. <laughs> some of you, and I'm sorry, but some of you have had Christians do that to you, and I'm sorry. They represent all of us, and pff, I'm sorry. Fishing is more about, man, you got to get them to nibble on the bait. See the difference? Hunting is one size fits all. It's a bullet. (laughs) Fishing, it's all about, you get to try all kinds of lures. There's all kinds of different, that's why there's so many different churches. You know, we realize that our church will catch some, and some of you just won't like us at all. All the bad people don't like us. (laughs) In hunting, if you miss your shot, you usually scare the animal off. They're done. One time, that's all you get. In fishing, you get to do it over and over. You get more than one chance. When you go out hunting, the animal has no choice. You shoot them dead. But in fishing, a fish has a choice. Do I want that or not? Big difference. Here's another one. In hunting... You've got to be a skilled shot in order to catch, in order to hunt, what, get what you're hunting. But in fishing, I have found out anybody can throw bait into the water and wait on a fish. I, I think there's a reason Jesus said fishers of men instead of hunters of men. And a live church, we need to get this. We're all about fishing for people. Jesus said, I'm going to teach you to fish for people. We're not about hunting. We're about fishing It's about the good news. Now, in Jesus' day, they used pretty much just nets for fishing. In our society, there are so many methods for fishing. I mean, uh, I have a bass boat with a sonar thing. It shows me where the fish is at. We're blessed in our society. There are so many methods, and we can't get stuck on one. So let's talk about developing our fishing skills a little bit. What do they need to know? I have that in your notes. What do they need to know? The number one thing that we all need to know is that Christ died for our sins. Jesus Christ died for our sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, for time's sake, I'm just going to look at these. I'm going to have you look at some other verses in a few moments in your Bibles, but let's look at this together. This is what Paul says. Let's read it together out loud. Join with us, Cotton Ranch. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said, he was buried. Now, we, we get this. Most of American society has heard this, but a lot of us don't believe it. He died for our sins. So what's the proof that he died for our sins? I want you to notice, Paul said he was buried. Everybody say buried. Buried. They literally, historically, we know they wrapped him in 120 pounds of cloth. That's how they buried folks back then. They would put him in this cloth because they didn't do the, uh, you know, today how we embalm people. They didn't have that. They wrapped him in this cloth. And not only did they wrap him in the cloth and prepare him for burial, but we know that history tells us, he, not just Paul, but he was buried. I pretty much have learned you don't bury people who are alive. Right? And even if you do, they're pretty much going to die. He was buried. He died for our sins. That's the proof. He was buried. We only bury dead people. Now, Jesus, he's talking about his own death. He, he predicts this uh, in Matthew chapter 26. Right, this is before he goes to the cross. And he shows us that this is the purpose of his death. He says, he, he took a cup of wine, he gave thanks for it. He gave it to them and he said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which the, confirms the covenant between God and his people. Now look at this line. It's poured out as a sacrifice to what? Forgive. One more time. To what? Forgive. To forgive the sins of many. He died 
for our sins. And he was buried. The second thing they need to know, that we all need to know, we need to understand this. Jesus rose to life on the third day. That's the Easter story, isn't it? We're about ready to celebrate that day. Christ died for our sins, and then he rose to life. Again, 1 Corinthians. Here's what Paul says. You need to know this. This is one of the foundations. He was buried, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scripture said. Folks, 